All right, so welcome everybody today to electrical safety training uh, for pool, the pool industry, for the pool professional. Um, I'm with Space Coast Pool School. I like to bring in people to talk on very specific topics for the industry that I think is very important um, that we learn and bring in somebody who is a very knowledgeable in that area. And so uh, we're gonna have Mike Childress here with Pentair. I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, everybody knows I teach CPO classes. You can find me on Facebook and everything. I'm teaching OSHA training now for the pool industry as well. You can get your OSHA 10 through me, CPI. So our main presenter is Mike Childress. He's with Pentair. And I met him at the Florida, uh -huh. everything under the sun trade show in Orlando, Florida last year. Um, I took his electrical safety course and I thought it was really good. And so I asked him and he agreed to be on today to do um, the presentation um, because I think that this is something that the industry doesn't talk a lot about a lot. And with my OSHA background, I can attest to that. So um, he's going to talk about some stuff that um, a lot of times we, you know, we do our, everybody in the industry does their thing and they kind of forget some of the safety things out there. So he's going to kind of hit on a lot of the things that are important to keep yourself safe while you're working around electrical equipment. So we're going to switch over to him. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You should be able to share your screen now, Mike, and it's all you on electrical right. safety for the pool industry. That sounds good. I'm going to start my broadcast now and switch over screens. I can see your screen, so hopefully everybody else can see your screen. Okay, I have this set up and I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, good morning here on the East Coast. If anyone's tuning in from the West, uh, might wanna get some more coffee. Might be kind of early for you guys. Uh, again, my name is Mike Childress. I'm a regional training manager for Pentair. Uh, I always like to start off my class by sharing my contact information. Uh, I have my email address and my cell phone number listed. Uh, I am in North Carolina. Um, if you have any questions about the content of the course or have any questions pretty much about anything uh, electrical, please uh, don't hesitate to send me an email or, or shoot me a text message. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, again, doing this live is uh, much different from doing it. Um, um, in person, uh, the live stream's a lot different. So if you guys have questions, you're going to have to hit me up via email or via text. It's not like you can stop me as we're going. Uh, we're here for electricity for the service professional. Uh, this class is not really meant for electricians. It's meant for pool service professionals. Um, it is a good class for electricians to come to because a lot of things that we deal with in pools and spas most general electricians won't deal with. Uh, it's something they don't deal with on a daily basis. Most electricians that do, that do pool or spa work are pretty much specialized in that field. They don't have time to do any other uh, major electrical work. They're pretty much stuck working with pools and spas. So it is a big difference um, when it comes to doing the electrical work versus uh, general electrical work. First important, uh, we have to cover electrical safety. When it comes to electrical safety, wear rubber sole shoes, flip flops and sandals are not appropriate when working with electricity. Uh, the key here is to prevent yourself from becoming a path to ground. That means electricity is always there. You never know where it is because you can't see it. Electricity has one unique trait. If you give it a path, it will go. So the term don't become a path to ground not necessarily referring to the ground, it refers to path of flow. Do not make a connection with two different areas because electricity can flow from one to the other through you. So it starts with flip-flops and sandals not being worn with electrical work. Get yourself a nice pair of rubber sole shoes. From there, we always have to look at what you're touching. Uh, one of my key points, when I go to a job site, before I touch anything, I'll check for the bond wire. The bond wire is a wire that is supposed to connect all the equipment. Anything that is metallic, conductive, within a certain area of the pool or spa has to be bonded. 
It doesn't mean that you're going to have electricity to it. It means it's conductive. It could have electricity there. So you bond everything together. Part of my safety, I know electricity will flow if I give it the path. If there is a bond wire, that electricity already has a path to flow. So chances are it's already in multiple locations. So I'm not going to touch two points that are different. Another thing to look at when doing an electrical work, remove any rings, watches, loose jewelry. If you don't want to take a ring off, put electrical tape over it. Uh, any conductive things you may be wearing, try to take those off or limit their uh, proximity to what you're doing. You do not have to touch something to get shocked. Electricity is just like water in many aspects. One of those aspects, path of least resistance. Water will flow that path, so will electricity. So in an electrical circuit, if there is a loose or corroded contact or connection, electricity would rather arc away from that connection and find a, a ring or a watch or anything conductive and flow a different path rather than force its way through a loose or corroded point. So it's very important to limit that ability by taking off any rings or watches, loose jewelry. I know in certain areas we wear long sleeves to keep from getting sunburned. And probably about four to six inches of our sleeves are wet where we cleaned out skimmer baskets or pumps, pump baskets. So make sure if you're wearing long sleeves to roll those up as well. That's something a lot of people forget about. And if you're going to have your hand in a panel or working with any kind of electrical connections, you want to limit that access. Disconnect power before performing any task. Uh, one of my key notes when doing electrical work you never know what's behind door number one. Always turn the power off before you open that door, whether it be a, an electrical connection compartment for a pool pump, whether it is a connection point for a heat pump, even a cover for an automation panel. You don't know what's behind there. You could have a loose wire. That cover could be the only thing holding that wire on its connection. So always turn the power off before opening the connections up. Verify you turn the right power, the right breaker off when you're disconnecting power. We've all seen breakers mislabeled. So check it with a voltmeter. Make sure you disconnect the power at the right point. Another thing that I do that's not listed here goes into why you're working on electrical in the first place. About 80% of most electrical problems you're going to troubleshoot in the pool and spy industry are going to be related to loose or corroded connections. Something has gotten loose, a, a connection has gotten corroded over time, and it's gonna cause an electrical issue. When you're troubleshooting that issue, you're gonna have to go into panels to find it. Disconnect the power, open the panel, verify you've disconnected the right breaker before you open the panel, but when you get into the panel, make sure that all the connections are tight before you turn the power back on and start troubleshooting. Chances are when you open the panel and you start checking connections, you'll see the corroded connection or you'll find the loose connection when you're tightening them up. And that will most likely be the reason you're going into that panel anyway. And you have fixed the problem before you ever turn the power back on. So that is a good troubleshooting tip for pool and spa professionals when trying to find an, a problem with a piece of equipment. The last thing on this page is don't work on electrical equipment in damp or wet weather. That to me, it's a little bit out of place. It can be the prettiest day of the year. We're still gonna be standing in a puddle of water where we've cleaned out the pump basket. So use extra caution. Always take caution when working on electrical equipment. We need to take a little more extra caution than most because we work in a wet industry. When it comes to electrical safety, when you're doing electrical work, use lockout tag out procedures to ensure your safety. Lock out and tag out any equipment that you're gonna be working on to ensure that it's not energized or has the potential energy to cause harm. That is very simple, it's an easy step to do. Most people do not do this. And that is a practice we need to start incorporating in our 
everyday life is to use tag out and lock out procedures. It's a simple lock out tag out. If you'll notice the lock out connection clips, how they have multiple holes. If you have multiple people on the job, each person should be issued their own lock and key. Whenever you're on that equipment set or on that job site, you should add your lock to this. That way, if someone comes in behind you, removes their lock and they try to energize this, but you're still working on it, that's going to prevent that from happening. Uh, tag out lockout does seem like it is a, an extended step and a lot of people don't want to do it, but it is something that we need to start practicing uh, on a daily basis. Use tag out lockout, especially if you're going to leave the site. You may have a homeowner or a property manager that may be coming around. You've got to lock the system out. That way they can't come in and, and turn things on. I've actually had homeowners come home and flip the breaker and turn the pump on right beside the filter that doesn't even have the top on it. And they walk away before the pump primes up and they don't even realize that water is flowing out the top of the filter. So be really careful. Tag out a lockout is something that we need to start practicing. Always ask yourself, is this safe and should I really be doing this? There is a point where most people are going to become uncomfortable working with electricity. When you reach that point, there's no shame in this. We are pool and spa professionals, not electricians. At this point, you're uncomfortable doing certain electrical work, contact the electrician. Let an electrician come in and, and take over from that point. Also with electrical safety, we have to look at the tools we're using. Use insulated and approved tools. There's a right tool for the job, use it. Every pool and spa professional should have a set of electrical tools to do their everyday work. You should have another set of tools for your general purpose tooling. You don't have to go out and buy all of this. There are three main tools that I highly recommend that everyone should have in the pool and spa industry for doing electrical work. The first is a number two Phillips screwdriver. It needs to be an electrical grade screwdriver. Next is a quarter inch cabinet tip or flat tip screwdriver. That again is electrical grade. And then a pair of wire stripping pliers. A 10 to 22 gauge set. That'll handle pretty much all of your connections up to a 10 gauge wire. Uh, the, 10, the 22 will handle your Low voltage wiring, if you're doing automation and you're making uh, 485 connections or temp sensor connections, those are usually an 18 gauge. So the 22 will cover that. Um, replace any damaged or worn tools. If they're worn, it's time to move on and get another set of another screwdriver, another set of wire stripping pliers. You do not want to use worn tools doing electrical work. If something slips off of a screw, you could hit a live contact in a box or a live contact in a connection. That's something we really don't want to do. Now I've stressed electrical grade when it comes to screwdrivers. The reason I stress that is we work in a wet environment. A screwdriver is a unique tool. We use a screwdriver to tighten screws, loosen screws. We also use a screwdriver as a chisel from time to time. I've used a screwdriver as a pry bar. And I've had something that's irritated me enough to where I've used the screwdriver as a hammer, grab the shaft of the, hand, the screwdriver and use the handle as the hammer head. We beat our tools up a little bit. The electrical grade has to do with this plastic. Where the shaft goes into this plastic, that plastic is a higher density plastic than most screwdrivers are made of. What this means is this plastic will stand some abuse. So if you beat on the tool, it'll get small cracks in the handle. Some of the other screwdrivers, the cracks will run all up in the handle. We work in a wet environment, water will get into the cracks. That's gonna be hard to dry out. You can't just take a rag and wipe it off and it be dry. There will be water in the handle of that screwdriver for days and it could be dangerous. You may touch a contact that's live and it'll energize that handle of that screwdriver and it'll shock you. So use electrical grade. 
they're high density plastic. They don't crack as easily as some of the others. Uh, there are some name brands out there that are good, better, and best. Uh, choose what you like. Honestly, I've had everything from Klein down to the Harbor Freight Doyle brand, and I find they work really well. Um, I do note the higher your higher price you're going to pay for them, the higher the name brand, I guess you would say, the better the screwdriver is going to be as far as durability. The tips on some of the major brands are hardened, so they will last longer versus some of the lesser expensive screwdrivers that are electrical grade. Uh, the tips don't last as long on those. So those are the three basic tools. There are two other tools I highly recommend. And these tools are specific to certain jobs in the pool and spa industry. Uh, the first is a number two Roberts bit screwdriver or square tip. This screwdriver is extremely handy when you're making connections to a breaker or a bus bar or a neutral bar, ground bar inside an automation panel. Those connections have a flat tip slash number two square drive screw. This will allow you to get more torque than a common flat tip screwdriver, and it will help that problem of having loose connections inside boxes, inside panels. So a number two square bit screwdriver is extremely handy. It's going to help you prevent from having loose connections over time. The other tool is a pair of wire crimping pliers or stay comp pliers. Um, a lot of people use wire strippers that have the crimpers built into them. I'm not a big fan of those. And the reason I'm not a fan of them, the crimping bits, the spade connectors, the ring connectors, those crimp bits are quarter inch crimp. So you're supposed to crimp a quarter of inch of wire inside that, that connection. The common wire stripping pliers that have the crimpers built into them are only about an eighth of an inch wide. So they're only going to crimp about half of what you need to crimp. A set of Staycom pliers, as shown in this picture, they're a quarter inch wide at the head. So when you crimp something, you're going to crimp the entire bit that needs to be crimped. It is also on the opposite side of the pivot. That means you're going to have higher leverage. Okay. Um, the, wire crimp, the wire crimping pliers. Uh, again, with the wire crimping pliers, uh, if you're doing connections or doing service on anything, I recommend using wire crimping pliers. They are uh, better than using a pair of wire strippers that have the crimpers built into them. They have a quarter inch wide head. So when you're doing the, the stripping of the, or not stripping, but crimping of the connection, it's gonna give you a full crimp on that quarter inch um, connector versus an eighth of an inch crimp with the, the wire stripping combo pliers. So it's much better using those. Um, they are a, well investment when it comes to a tool, you're not gonna wear these things out. They're gonna last pretty much your whole lifetime if you can keep up with them. Uh, I do recommend these because the crimping point is on the opposite side of the pivot. So you get much more leverage crimping versus the stripping crimping pliers. Usually the crimps are on the inside of the pivot point so you don't have as much leverage. And when you crimp it, you don't get a tight connection with the crimp. Um, another thing I like to point out when I'm here talking about making connections or repairing wires where you have to use butt splices or crimp connections. If you're doing any wire repairs on low voltage, this is not for pool lights, but on any kind of low voltage connections for automation, heat pumps, heaters, whatever you may have low voltage, do not use wire nuts. Wire nuts will corrode over time, and that's going to cause the connection to be weak and build resistance. If you're making low voltage connections, always use a butt splice connector and a little bit of heat shrink works really well. You slide a piece of heat shrink over your butt splice connector, heat it up, it shrinks it down, you don't get any corrosion in it. So that's another thing I like to do when it comes to using these types of tools. When we get into voltmeters, 
there's a lot of different kind of voltmeters out there and choosing the right one can be important. Uh, I've got five voltmeters on the screen. The first two are multifunction style. These two have the ability to use the selector switch, do most of your testing within a certain range. Uh, the next is a clamper amperage style. These amperage or clamp style are generally used to clamp on a test amperage along with some other voltage and continuity testing capabilities. The last one you see is analog style. This particular meter is an old Simpson 260 style meter. It's a pin and jewel type, type meter. In our industry, this type of meter should never be used in the field. Uh, the only particular job you would do with this meter would be testing a, a bonding for a pool. And that's generally left up to an electrician because if you have a bonding issue, the electrician is going to be the one to know how to find it and how to make the, the proper corrections to that bonding grid to make it correct. Um, most of us are going to be looking at one of these types of meters to use, which one to use and why to use it. Now, I do have a particular meter I like to use for particular jobs, and there's reasoning behind that. The first style, multifunction style meters, I prefer those when I'm working with automation panels or gas heaters. Uh, these particular meters, you'll notice they're, they're square. They don't have a lot of things protruding from them. And they're generally smaller than the clamper amperage style. That's going to allow me to be around a lot of wires and the meter not get hung up. Because we've all seen automation panels and gas heaters with the wiring that's just everywhere. That particular meter is going to work better in those applications. The clamper amperage style meter is my go-to if I'm working on a pool pump or a heat pump. Uh, with a pool pump or a heat pump, my rule there, never leave a job without checking amperage. Always test amperage on a pool pump. It will let you know that pump is operating the way it should be. And in order to check amperage, you're going to need a clamp style meter. So a clamp style meter is what I use in those applications. Now, for selecting a meter, the first thing we have to look at when it comes to electrical safety and using a voltmeter is the voltmeter itself. Is it the proper meter to be using? The first thing we have to look for to identify that meter is the category rating. It should be a category two or better. So two or higher, two, three, or four. This particular meter is a category three up to 600 volts. The category rating should be listed right near where your connections are made to the meter for your leads. Some of the clamp style also have it at the top near the clamp. If you do not see a category rating on the front of the voltmeter, look on the back. Sometimes it was embossed into the plastic on the back of the meter. And then if you can't find it on the back or the front, look inside the battery compartment. If you can't find a category rating on that meter and it has a hard plastic body and you've had it for some period of time, it may be time to retire that meter and get one that does have a category rating of two or better. Uh, this is extremely important. The category rating has to do with how well it's insulated to help protect you from electrical shock. If the meter were to short out while you're using it, well, you're holding that meter in your hand. So now it's going to be dangerous. So category two or better. The next thing you're looking at is to choose a meter that has the correct voltage or amperage range for your application. Now, this particular meter, again, is a category three up to 600 volts, category three up to 600 amps. So you're looking for the range, 600 volt, 600 amp. Now, there's several ranges to choose from. The first range you'll find if you're out shopping for a voltmeter is going to be 300 volts. That particular voltmeter is meant for homeowners. It's not meant for everyday use. So I do not recommend those voltmeters for professional use, for pool and spa professions. You need to take a step up. The next step from 300 would be 600 volts. So 600 is the mid-range for voltmeters. That is a good range for professional meters for pretty much every homeowner application, residential application. That will cover you. This particular meter, again, is up to 600 volts. So it should cover anything you're going to encounter in a residential application. 
There is another range in the voltmeter selection process. It is 600 volts. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, 1,000 volts. The 1,000 volt meter are meters that I would recommend if you're doing commercial work. Uh, there are a lot of pool pumps out there that are 600 volts or better. And in those applications, they're going to be commercial. You'll need a voltmeter that will be able to handle that voltage uh, and give you an accurate reading safely. So that would be a 1,000 volt. And again, those would be something you're going to use on commercial applications. When it comes to a voltmeter, once you have your category and your range, look for other features on the meter. One of the most common things I look for are readily available replacement leads. Uh, the leads that you see on the meter, they can vary. Some of them will be smaller. They'll have thinner wires to the leads, and they're not common. That means they're going to be harder to find. Some of the other meters, and generally they're a little more expensive, usually $20 to $30 more expensive than some of the other meters you'll see. You'll notice the price difference has to do with the meter's leads the larger leads are going to be more expensive. It's going to drive the price of your voltmeter up about 20 to 30 bucks. Use the one or choose the one that has the larger leads. They're larger, more durable. They can handle a lot more abuse and they're a little longer. Uh, some of the leads for these particular meters are going to be up to about four feet long. Some of the smaller leads are going to be two to two and a half feet long. Choose the longer leads. Uh, a key to working with voltmeters, give yourself room to use the voltmeter. When you're doing testing, you want to be able to hold your voltmeter and extend your arm into the test area, make your testing connection, and not be too close to that area. Uh, again, we told you about uh, loose connections, corroded connections, the ability of electricity to arc and touch you without you touching it. When doing electrical testing, that's going to be one of the points where electricity can jump over and, and let you know it's there. So be extremely careful. The longer leads are going to give you greater room or distance between what you're testing and yourself. If you're doing testing for amperage, the clamp style meter is what you would need to use. The clamp style meter differs greatly in the multifunction style in amperage testing uh, department because with a multifunction style meter to test amperage, you actually have to open the circuit and use the meter to close the circuit. So the voltage will actually flow through the meter and you will read amperage through that path. You cannot use a multifunction style meter to test pool pumps. The starting amperage of a pool pump motor will be greater than the amperage of a multifunction style meter, and it could be dangerous and it will damage your meter. You will need to use a clamp style meter. Clamp styles are uninterrupted. They are uninterrupted. That means you're not going to interrupt the flow of voltage, the flow of current. You're going to clamp around one wire and one wire only. And then through induction, it will read the amperage flowing through that wire. Uh, again, it can't be a drop cord. It can't be multiple wires. It can't be the conduit. It has to be one wire at a time. If you're testing amperage on a circuit, there's always a minimum of two wires to a circuit. So when you're checking amperage, you have to check amperage on both wires. And the balance, the load should be balanced. So when you're testing amperage, it should be balanced equal on each line. Some of the meters, they range from AC to DC, low to high voltage. A multimeter that has auto ranging capabilities may be more convenient and desirable. Uh, to note that, you're gonna see on your voltmeters, they're gonna have a select or a mode button. That's gonna allow you to choose different things within a certain range. Say voltage, if you're checking voltage, that mode or select button will give you AC or DC up on the screen. If you're testing continuity or resistance, you will see continuity and resistance on this screen. Whenever you hit the select button, it will alternate between the two. So the mode or select button gives you the ability to, to do that. There are meters that are auto ranging. They do it themselves. 
But for pool and spa professionals, I don't recommend uh, the average pool and spa professional to go out and buy those. They're usually a couple hundred dollars more expensive than a standard meter as pictured on the screen here. These meters, you have to press the motor select button to do it manually. Now, electrical safety. When you've got a voltmeter, a good safe practice is to test that voltmeter on a routine basis. Now, some of the tests need to be done daily. The first test that has to be done daily is check the leads. When you check the leads, a good practice is to grab the leads at the meter where they're connected and wiggle the lead to make sure it's tight in the connection point at the voltmeter. Then you're going to draw your hand through the leads or draw the leads through your hand. And you're going to feel the leads all the way down to the barrels and the tips. What you're feeling for is any damage to the leads. If there's any nicks, cuts, or any damage to those leads, replace them. Never try to repair a set of leads. If you have a lead that's damaged, do not tape it. You cannot tape a lead properly and have it be safe. So always replace them. When you get to the barrels, ensure that where the wire goes into the barrel, it's, it's snug. Then when you get to the tip, make sure the tip is snug in the barrel. A lot of people will have these damaged and it'll be loose. The tip will be loose or the wire going into the handle or barrel will be loose and you'll get a bad reading. And that's simple from a bad set of leads. The next thing is to ensure you have a good battery in your meter. Ensure you have a good battery. A lot of voltmeters have a battery a low battery indication that will pop up on the meter, but most of the meters will not show that until the battery is almost dead. So at that point, it's too late. You always want to test the leads to make sure the batteries are good or test with the leads to make sure the battery is good in the meter. The way to test this is to set the voltmeter for ohms. If you set the voltmeter for the ohm setting, and touch the black and red test leads together, you should display a reading of zero ohms. If the meter does not register zero ohms, replace the battery and retest. If you're testing the meter and your battery, or excuse me, you do not read zero ohms and you replace the battery and you're retesting it and you still don't read zero ohms, you may need to replace the leads. So at this point, you put a new battery in the meter you're still reading resistance, replace the leads, put new leads on the meter. If you're still not reading zero ohms and you've already replaced the battery and you've just put a new set of leads on the meter, that meter has been damaged. At some point during your testing, you've damaged the meter, the meter now has to be replaced. The only two things that are gonna cause the meter not to read zero ohms when you're touching the leads together or, or three things. Number one is the dead battery, two, bad leads, and three, a damaged meter. So at this point, you've done the two out of the three, you have to replace the meter. Uh, many meter, meters have auto ranging capabilities. Uh, we talked about that, where there's a common setting for voltage, common setting for amperage. You're gonna use the mode or select button in order to choose AC or DC. There are designated by a symbol to combination of the AC and DC symbols, usually located above the A or the V on the voltmeter. So if you'll look at the symbols here, you have V for voltage, and right above it, there is a straight line and a curved line. So if we look at it, you'll have this symbol. On this particular meter, it's this symbol and this. That means it's auto ranging. The top is AC, the bottom is DC. So the top of that symbol, that sine wave rep represents alternating current and the solid line represents direct current. Now, voltmeters are different depending on the manufacturer. They will use different variations of these symbols. Uh, AC is pretty much common. You see the sine wave, that's alternating current. Direct current is where they vary. Direct current can be a solid line or it could be a broken line. 
Uh, if it's direct current only, it'll be a solid line with a broken line beneath it. So it will vary. This symbol can be on top of that symbol. So it doesn't matter if one's on top of the other. They just put them on there according to the manufacturer of each meter. So they could be a little different. If anyone on here has questions of the symbols on your meter, please feel free to take a picture of your meter. Uh, you can email it or text it to me and ask whatever questions you would like to ask of it. And I will help determine what you need to do with your meter and how to set it up and what the symbols mean. So moving on, we talk about wiring. So we've got our tools, we've talked about safety. Now we need to go into wiring. Uh, in the United States, we use AWG, average wire gauge or American wire gauge. That is the number used to indicate the wire's diameter. The smaller the number, the larger the wire. So when you're looking at a wire, a number two is gonna be larger than a number 12. So the smaller the number, the bigger the wire. When we're talking about wire, wire size is dictated by current load or amperage on a circuit. When you have a higher current, you need a bigger wire. Same with plumbing. If you need more flow, you have to have a bigger pipe. So when you're dealing with wire, the bigger the current in that circuit, the bigger the wire you're gonna to need to carry that current. Now, here's where we have a little issue with some electricians. Most electricians that do general electrical in the, in the world, they're used to sizing wire to current load. Now in the pool and spa industry, we have a minimum wire size of a number 12. No pool pump, no pump motor can be run with a smaller wire than a number 12. 12 is the bare minimum. Now, if you look at the current on a circuit, some pool pumps will only pull, let's say six amps. Well, with a six amp circuit, most electricians would look at that circuit and say, okay, you have a six amp circuit. We can get by with a number 14 or a number 16 wire, let's say 25 feet. And if they're not familiar with pool and spa, which is the 680 uh, section of the NEC code book, they will wire that circuit with the number 16 or number 14 wire because it is appropriate for that current load. However, in the 680 section of the NEC code book, it clearly states that no motor can be run with a smaller wire than a number 12 gauge. So in the field, for us as pool professionals, when you're looking at a circuit and you see a small wire being used to run a pool pump, that is incorrect. The smallest wire you can use on any pump motor, regardless of horsepower, is going to be a number 12. So 12 is going to be the smallest wire you'll use. Now, for your general knowledge, number 12 will carry a 20 amp circuit up to and over 400 feet. I think it may be close to the five, but I'm going to use four as my reference. I don't know the exact number right off the top of my head, but I've never seen a pool pump run 400 feet. But it will carry you up to 400 feet, 20 amps, which is going to mean up to a three horsepower pump. So a three horsepower pump is going to be a 16 amp circuit. That's going to mean 20 amps. It's going to be your run. So 20 amps, number 12 gauge wire up to 400 feet, you will be perfectly fine. Now, if you're going to go up, let's say you have a five horsepower pump that you have to install. A five horsepower pump is going to be a 30 amp circuit. So up to three will cover 20 amp. And then from three up to five is going to be a 30 amp circuit. Now, a 30 amp circuit should be run with a number 10 gauge wire. So you're gonna go up in size. So you're gonna go from a 12 up to a 10 in your wire sizing. Now, when it comes to the wire sizing, if the current in the circuit is too great for the wire being used, the wire is gonna overheat. That can melt the insulation, that could call fire or a safety hazard. Now, when it comes to this and you're wiring a circuit, under no circumstances should any pool pump be ran with an extension cord. Uh, extension cords should not be used in pool and spa applications. Uh, generally, most extension cords are under a number 12 wire. 
they're usually a 14 or a 16. They will not carry their current load. And in some applications, if you do have a number 10 extension or extension cord, the run is going to be longer than it should, or excuse me, number 12 extension cord. The run's going to be longer and it's not going to be very convenient or safe to run an extension cord to a pull pump. Uh, you have connections there that do not uh, withstand that kind of load over a continuous run. The extension cords are temporary under certain circumstances, but should never be used in pool and spy applications. Now, when it comes to wiring, we talk about the wiring, we look at the colors of the wire, and we have to interpret what those colors mean. So there's a lot of different colors used in wiring. So we'll start with the standard US wire colors for power wires. There's five uh, basic colors. It's black, red, blue, orange, and yellow. Now, black and red are your primary wires for delivering power for single phase applications. Your black wire is generally your primary wire, your second, or your red wire is your secondary wire. So if you have a 240 volt circuit, line one will be black, line two will be red. Now, in commercial applications, this is pretty standard. They do not want you deviating from this in commercial. However, residentially, you can use pretty much any color wire you'd like, as long as your inspector will approve that. Uh, we have seen people use yellow wires for pool pumps, blue wires for lights, and black wires for other circuits. Uh, just know that that is for residential only, and it must be approved through your inspector. Uh, if you see a brown, orange, or yellow, or orange, yellow, or blue, in a commercial application, that is going to indicate three-phase power. That is not single phase, it is three phase. At this point, when you deliver or when you're working with three phase power, we recommend that electricians be involved in that work. Um, electricians should be handling three phase. If you're not an electrician, you should leave that to an electrician to handle. After we deal with our color wires, we're gonna look at the white wire. White is your neutral. That's your neutral wire, that's your balancing wire for 110 volt circuits. Then we look at the ground wire. Green is ground. In high voltage, green cannot be anything else. Uh, if you use a green wire in a high voltage application for anything other than ground, you will fail an inspection. Do not place any tape on a green wire in a high voltage application. It should be untaped. Uh, green is ground, can't be used for anything else. Now, green has a special purpose. When we look at wires, our standard U.S. wires or power wires, they deliver power. So power is going to be delivered to whatever device you're going to power. Let's say we have a pool pump here. We're delivering the voltage to the pump. Now, the power comes from the power plant. It doesn't matter what it goes through to get to your pump. This is the power plant. This is your pump. It'll go through whatever connections all the way to your pump. You're going to use that energy to drive your pump. If that pump were to fail, it needs a place to go. Well, this green ground wire came with these two wires. So this is your power plant. This is your pool pump. No matter what it went through, it came from the power plant and it connects to your pool pump. Nothing comes on this wire. This wire is meant to return the power. This wire connects to the housing of the pump motor. So if the electricity being delivered shorts out, which means that pump fails, the voltage will go through the frame of that motor to try to get away. When it goes to the frame of the motor, it's gonna jump on the green ground wire and go back to where it came from, which is theoretically the power plant. However, we use ground fault circuit interrupter breakers, GFCI. A GFCI breaker should be your closest point of disconnect for that pool pump. So let's say right here is our GFCI. It's in our automation panel. These wires go from that breaker directly to that pump. If anything fails on that pump, 
it'll jump on the ground wire and try to go home back to the power plant. Well, this ground wire has to go into that box where that GFCI is. A G stands for ground. So if there's any power on that ground wire, it will trip that GFCI in that panel and it will disconnect the power going to that pump. That will eliminate that circuit. That'll mean it'll be a safe circuit. That's the importance of the ground wire. The ground wire takes power away. So that's what everyone needs to understand about ground. You're not going to send voltage to the earth. You're going to send it to the ground, or excuse me, you're not going to send it to the ground. You're going to send it to the earth. You're going to send it to the ground wire, which in turn takes it away from you. So grounding is the practice of giving voltage a path to flow if a circuit fails. You only ground something that you apply power to. So that's an important thing for everyone to remember. Bonding is different. Bonding is a number eight solid copper conductor. Now, when it comes to bonding, bonding is the practice of intentionally electrically connecting all exposed metallic items not designed to carry electricity in a room, building, or designated area for protection from electric shock. Now, this is key. Electrically connecting metallic items not designed to carry electricity. That means you're going to connect a wire to something that you do not apply power to. Now, when it comes to bonding, bonding is different. Bonding is making everything equal, limiting the difference of electrical potential. Sorry about my text overlapping here. But bonding is creating a circuit. Now, remember I showed earlier that the ground wire was given to you by the power plant. It came from the power plant. It's part of your electrical circuit supplying power. It's meant to take voltage away from you. A bond wire isn't given to you. Bonding is something we make for ourselves in the pool and spy industry. We create our own bonding network. Everything that is metallic within a certain distance of the pool has to be bonded. If it's conductive, you've got to bond it. It doesn't matter if you apply power to it or not. You have to bond it if it's conductive. Now, where you're bonding something that has a ground on it, well, you only ground something that you apply power to. So anything that's conductive that we attach to our circuit, if you apply power to it over the contact limit, and for pools and spas, that contact limit is 15 volts. Anything over 15 volts must be bonded. Anything under 15 volts, if it's conductive, it has to be bonded. If it's non-conductive, that means it's not metal. It's made out of plastic. An example of that are going to be some types of pool lights, 12-volt pool lights. If they're all plastic, they're non-conductive. So they don't have to be bonded. You'll also notice that with non-conductive pool lights, they do not have a bond wire, or excuse me, a ground wire. They don't have a ground wire coming to them. Now, transformers, we'll talk about transformers, how a transformer works. I'm not going to get too much into this, but with a transformer, the electric current flows through the wire and it generates a magnetic field around it. So you'll notice on a transformer, you have a primary coil and a secondary coil. The primary coil is where you energize the power, input voltage. Your secondary coil is your output voltage. If you'll notice in this diagram, this illustration, these two connections do not electrically connect. These wires do not connect to these wires. They're just extremely close to each other. When you energize the primary side, it creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field is then picked up by the secondary side of the coil, and you have your output voltage there. Depending on how this transformer is wound, it is going to dictate if the voltage is going to go up or down. Now, when it comes to transformers, when you're dealing with a transformer, you have to be careful. You notice that little illustration we just did? Go back and do it again. Did you see the smoke escaping? That is what I like to call the smoke genie. If you improperly wire a transformer and you energize that transformer, 
you will let the smoke genie out. Now, the smoke genie will not grant you three wishes, and no matter how bad you want him to, he's not going to go back in there. So when it comes to wiring transformers, we have to get it right the first time. When you're dealing with transformers that are dual voltage, those transformers come from the factory wired for the highest voltage capable on the input side or primary side. Now, when it comes to transformers that we deal with on a daily basis in pools and spas, the first one we'll talk about is a step-down transformer. And this is a single output step-down. The input on the primary side of this particular transformer is dual voltage, 120 or 240. The secondary is a single output, which is 24 volts in this, in this illustration. These transformers are common in heat pumps and gas heaters. It's a very common transformer. The next transformer we'll talk about, it's also a dual voltage for the input, but it's a multi-tap, multi-use transformer. On the secondary side, there's multiple voltages. It's multi-tap, multi-use, meaning all of these voltages are active at the same time. You can use all of these voltages simultaneously. Now, it's important to note both of these transformers are what I like to call device transformers. They come within a, a device or a product. They are meant to power that device and that device only. So whether it be the 24 volt single output or the multi-tap, multi-use transformer, these voltages can only apply power to the appliance that the transformer is in. If you were to try to use these voltages or any of the voltages to power something external from that appliance, it will short out the transformer. So that's extremely important to note here. There is another transformer that is very common in pools and spas, and it is a multi-tap single-use step-down transformer. This is common in lighting. Now, when it comes to the lighting, it has multiple taps. Now, depending on the wattage of that transformer is going to depend on what those taps are and how many there are. Uh, most commonly, you're going to have 12 and 13 available for a 100-watt transformer, and then you'll have 12, 13, and 14 for a 300-watt transformer. Now, the maximum output voltage for any 12-volt pool light is going to be 15 volts. That is your contact limit for 12 volt lighting for pools and spas. The input voltage is always gonna be 120 volts. You will not see a dual voltage transformer for pool lights. That is against the NEC code. Maximum supply voltage for any pool light, whether direct or indirect is 150 volts. So it cannot be a 240 volt pool light in the field. Now, which voltages should you use? If you're putting in low voltage lights, if it's a 12 volt light and it's incandescent or halogen and it's one light only, if it's within 50 feet, you will wire it to the 12 volt tap. Within 75 feet, wire it to the 13. And within 100 feet, wire it to the 14 volt tap. If you have multiple lights, regardless of distance, they're incandescent or halogen, always wire them to the 14 volt tap. Incandescent halogen bulbs are finicky when it comes to what voltage you apply to them. Too much or too little, you'll burn up the light. Now, when it comes to LED lighting, LED lighting is more forgiving. With LED lighting, we recommend you wire it to the 14 volt tab. The higher the voltage, the lower the amperage. An LED is a light emitting diode so the higher voltage will make the light slightly brighter, but it will actually run cooler. The higher the voltage, lower the amperage. The amperage is what's going to bring the heat to an LED light. Now, a quick tip. Getting close to the end of this class, so some quick tips for wiring. If you're wiring low voltage lighting, for pools and spas, low voltage lighting is one of the critical wiring uh, points that we're going to have. When you're wiring low voltage from a transformer to the light itself, usually these two wires, one from the transformer, one from the pool light, are not the same type. One of them may be a little bit softer, a little bit thicker than the other. 
when you're making the connection, take the two wires, get a roll of tape, and tape the two wires together, probably about three or four inches below the wire itself. At this point, do not twist these two wires together. Drop a wire nut over the two wires and let the wire nut twist the wires. What this is gonna do, this is gonna allow each wire to evenly touch the inside spring of that wire nut. As you start to turn it, the wire nut will actually crush the two wires together and bite into each wire equally. As you, trust, as you twist the wire nut, it'll tighten up on both wires and make a nice, solid, strong connection. If you were to twist the two wires together first, the softer, smaller wire will always wrap around the harder wire. Once you get the two wires twisted together with the wire nut properly, you still have the tape right here. Notice I did not break that roll of tape off when I taped the wires together. At this point, you get the wire nut tight, wrap that tape all the way up to the top backwards. So when you're twisting that tape around the wire, have the sticky side of the tape facing outward. When you get to the top of the wire nut, all this is going to be sticky. You're going to flip the tape right side out and come back down. Now this is the slick side of the tape on the outside. At this point, you can break off the roll of tape, cut the tape off, use your hand to, to squeeze that wire nut connection inside that tape, get the tape nice and tight around it. Then you're gonna put that connection into the junction box. When you put it in the junction box, make sure the wire nut is pointing toward the sky. That's gonna help reduce any corrosion inside the connection and prevent failures due to voltage drops caused by resistance due to that corrosion any kind of resistance due to a loose connection, you're gonna limit that. It also helps you in the future. If you ever have an issue and you need to access these wires, all you have to do is put a pocket knife between the two wires and cut to the bottom of the wire nut. The only tape stuck to the wires is right here where you first tape two wires together. When you pop that tape off, it's a nice clean wire, nice clean wire nut underneath that connection. You'll be able to unscrew that wire nut, disconnect the two wires. You should have nice, clean copper underneath there and not have to worry about stripping the wire back trying to find clean copper due to corrosion. So, so that's a quick tip to help in wiring uh, low voltage lighting. It's not necessary in high voltage lighting. So with 120 volt light, that is not necessary. Uh, if you would like to do that, it's gonna prevent corrosion but in high voltage, you're not going to have that big of an issue. Um, another quick tip in wiring, a lot of people ask a lot, what do you do if you have one wire that's stranded, one wire that's solid? How do you make that connection? If you have a solid wire and a stranded wire and you're going to make a connection via a wire nut, when you put the two wires together, have the stranded wire about an eighth of an inch longer than the, cop than the solid wire. So when you put the wire nut on the wire, it'll go on the stranded wire first. And as you start to turn it, it will twist some of the strands in the top of the wire nut. And then it'll grip the solid wire as you keep turning it and it will bind the two together tightly. So that's a little tip when it comes to making that kind of connection. Um, we got to the point where we're at the end of the class. So I'd like to offer anyone that has any questions, feel free to uh, send me your information, send your questions via text or email, and I'll put my information back on the screen and finish the class. Um, again, my name is Mike Childress. I'm welcome to any questions you may have, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending.